Uh -huh. So the meeting will be recorded. Um, just for all of you to know, um, yeah, welcome to the PhD defense of Sergei Tikmo, Tikomirov. God, all the names will be difficult. Uh, with the title Security and Privacy of Blockchain Protocols and Applications. Um, before we start, let me introduce the defense committee. Um, I start with uh, the deputy chairman, Professor Andre Miller from University of Illinois. Um, then members are Dr. Patrick McCorry from PISA Research in London, Professor Maffei from the TU in Vienna, and as an expert in advisory capacity, Dr. Arthur Gervais, Imperial College London. And of course, as supervisor, Alex Beyukov from University of Luxembourg. Um, Sergey, you know that you start with a presentation of 45 minutes up to 60 minutes max. Um, and I propose that all the other two members um, uh, shut down their video and, and of course also close their mic to uh, limit the need of bandwidth and later we can uh, come back to for the question and answer session. So Sergey, the floor is yours. Please present your book. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me share my slides now. Does everyone see the slides? That's good. Good. Am I starting? No, it's fine. You can start. Um, it's visible. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Welcome. I'm happy to be presenting to you today some of my results of my PhD studies at the University of Luxembourg. And my PhD thesis is entitled Security and Privacy of Blockchain Protocols and Applications. So to start off, I would like to provide some uh, higher level motivation and put my work into a broader context. So as you may know, money that we use every day are controlled and issued by governments or central banks, and there are certain problems with this approach. The issuance of centrally controlled currencies may be unpredictable, and in case this issuance is excessive, this punishes the savers and favors the insiders who stand closer to the uh, money printer than others, and this also exacerbates inequality. Also, electronic centrally controlled money systems facilitate censorship and surveillance. It is not a secret that all our electronic transactions are being constantly monitored and recorded. This data is being bought and sold, and we may be denied access to our accounts based on just one transaction that was deemed suspicious. Finally, governments often use currencies that they control as a political tool, which is not always in line with the goal of a currency to be a neutral and universal store of value, unit of account, and medium of exchange. And I would like to provide a few very recent examples to illustrate these points. So, uh, for example, this gentleman is the president of one of the branches of the U.S. Federal Reserve and apparently trying to instill confidence in the people. He says that there is an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve, which does not sound very reassuring from a saver's standpoint. The second screenshot that I want to share with you illustrates the growing disparity between, on the one hand, the dire economic situation and the raising unemployment as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. And on the other hand, the raising stock market fueled by the newly issued money. And finally, a quote in the bottom of the slides illustrates how the United States use their power over the world reserve currency, the US dollar, to impose their foreign policy objectives on other countries. And while these examples may look a little bit too US centric, the same principles apply to all centrally controlled currencies. There have been many attempts to create a decentralized digital currency, starting from first proposals of electronic cash by David Chom in 1980s, but it took nearly three decades to develop a fully working solution, Bitcoin. An important stepping stone in this direction was the invention of digital signatures in 1970s, which allow us to verify the authenticity of a transaction that it was really sent by the sender. But digital signatures alone are not sufficient to solve this problem, because the key challenge that the cryptography community was unable to solve for decades was the double spending problem. In particular, a monetary system must prevent a malicious sender from signing two valid transactions that spend the same digital coin 
to two different recipients. A usual way to solve this problem is to trust a central party like a bank, which keeps track of everyone's balances and prevents double spending attempts. But solving double spending problem without a trusted third party proved to be very difficult. But Bitcoin, introduced by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008, managed to solve this problem. And in the next slide, I will explain how it works. Bitcoin is based on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Nodes connect, connect in the network and send transactions to each other. Some subset of nodes are special nodes called miners. What miners do is they produce blocks of transactions which are linked in a chain using a cryptographic hash function. In particular, each block includes the hash of the previous block. Therefore, any modification in any block will cause modifications in all the subsequent blocks. It's, it is impossible to change just one block somewhere in the middle of this chain. Crucially, each block also includes a solution to a cryptographic puzzle called proof of work, which proves that the miner who produced the block performed a certain amount of computational work. So how does this help Bitcoin solve the double spending problem? Imagine we have two transactions which conflict with each other. They cannot be included in one block because this block will be detected as invalid, and they cannot even be included in one chain of blocks. What may happen is that malicious sender may include these two conflicting transactions in two blocks which reference the same parent block. This situation is called a fork, and in order to resolve this conflict, Bitcoin nodes apply the fork choice rule. They prefer the allows Bitcoin nodes to achieve consensus on the single state of the system without trusting any third party. Last but not least, uh, Bitcoins enter into circulation according to a predictable deflationary schedule. Miners get rewarded with new Bitcoins for creating blocks. The block rewards get decreased in half every approximately four years. And as a result, the total number of Bitcoins in circulation never will exceed 21 million. Bitcoin's architecture emphasizes security and resilience, sometimes at the expense of other desirable properties that we would like to have. And there are multiple challenges that Bitcoin provides and other cryptocurrencies or protocols aim to solve. In my research, I'm focusing on three of these challenges. So let me introduce these three challenges and um, which ways may be used to address them. The first challenge that uh, is important for me is privacy. Transactions in Bitcoin are broadcast in plain text and they are stored in a globally accessible distributed database. Therefore, on the one hand, it is necessary for everyone to be able to verify the rules of the blockchain. On the other hand, this means that anyone can download this data, analyze it, de-anonymize users, which is in, in conflict with the initial vision of uh, neutral, independent digital money. There are multiple ways to address the problem and prevent blockchain transactions from being de-anonymized. Multiple defenses have been developed uh, that prevent blockchain analysis, for example, those based on zero-knowledge proofs in some of the alternative cryptocurrencies. And there are also uh, some research on the network analysis and how to prevent an adversary from listening to the traffic and de-anonymize the transactions this way. Part of my research is uh, dedicated to network analysis, and I will talk about this in more detail later in this presentation. The second challenge is scalability. As mentioned earlier, all nodes must be able to validate all transactions. If this is not the case, this means that transaction validation is outsourced to some powerful servers in someone's data centers, which brings us back to the old security model where we have to trust someone to tell us what the state of the system is. Therefore, Bitcoin's transaction throughput is severely limited. It can handle around seven transactions per second, and there are multiple ways to increase this number, starting from modifications in the Bitcoin protocol itself to alternative blockchains and cryptocurrencies that take different approaches to solving scalability to off-chain protocols, or also known as layer two protocols. An example of these protocols is the Lightning Network for Bitcoin, and such protocols move the transaction off the blockchain while preserving at least some of the security guarantees of the blockchain transactions. 
This is the current focus of my research, and the third and the final part of this presentation is dedicated to the Lightning Network. Finally, another challenge which is interesting to me is programmability. If the money that we develop here is digital, it would be nice to encode conditions for spending and for various contracts in electronic form. Bitcoin allows um, transaction creators to specify the condition under which the coins can be spent using Bitcoin's script language. But this language is intentionally very limited. It is not Turing complete, which on the one hand decreases the potential attack surface, but on the other hand, many complex contracts uh, cannot be implemented or it is hard to implement them. There are alternative approach approaches to blockchain uh, programmability, and the primary example here is Ethereum, which is an, an alternative blockchain that incorporates a virtual machine which can execute programs, which are called smart contracts, in a Turing complete programming language. This rich programming environment introduces many new challenges, um, among others related to security uh, and safety of smart contract development. And part of my thesis is uh, dedicated to these problems, but uh, due to time constraints, I will not be talking about these issues in this presentation. So the outline of the rest of this talk is as follows. In the second part of the talk, I will um, describe our findings and our results regarding network level privacy in Bitcoin and privacy focused cryptocurrencies. I will show how a well-connected adversary can link transactions that have been issued from the same node based solely on peer-to-peer -peer traffic. Then I will talk about the Lightning Network and its security and privacy properties. I will present our results where we quantify the effect of various parameters on the probability of privacy attacks on the Lightning Network, and I will show that it's enough to compromise just a few important nodes to achieve a high probability of success for the attacker. I will also discuss a limitation on the throughput for Lightning Network payments, especially for small payments, and uh, a related denial of service attack vector where an attacker can block any channel by sending many small transactions. So let's move on to part two of this presentation, transaction clustering in Bitcoin and privacy-focused cryptocurrencies. This uh, part of the presentation covers chapter three of the thesis. Let's talk in more detail about how transactions are propagated in the Bitcoin network. So we have Alice and Bob here, and they are connected to a few nodes in the network. Say Alice wants to send a transaction to Bob. She creates this transaction, she signs it locally, and broadcasts it to her neighboring nodes. And these nodes send it to their neighboring nodes and so on. The transaction eventually gets propagated to the whole network. And even Bob at this point is aware that Alice is trying to send money to him, but before a transaction is included in a block, Bob cannot be sure that transaction is not going to be reversed. Now, yellow nodes on this graph denote miners. Miners are constantly trying to create a new block based on the latest transactions. And after some time, 10 minutes on average, for example, this miner solves the proof of work puzzle and generates the next block, which includes our transaction. From this point, it is considered confirmed, at least to some extent, but if Bob wants to get stronger guarantees, he should wait for a few more blocks to be generated on top of this one. Now, uh, what happens if Mallory wants to understand where transaction, transactions actually come from? What she can do is she can connect to all the nodes in the network and listen to transaction announcements and note where they come from and when they arrive. So if Alice starts transaction propagation, then Mallory receives the transaction announcements first from the black nodes on the left, then from the dark gray nodes, then from light gray nodes, and then from the white nodes. Based on this information, Mallory can uh, hypothesize that certain nodes are closer to the original sender than some other nodes. To prevent these kind of attacks, Bitcoin randomizes transaction propagation. So Alice, instead of sending a new transaction to all of her neighbors at the same time, introduces random delays. So she first sends a transaction to just one neighboring node, 
then to the second one, and then to the third neighboring node. As a result, the picture that Mallory gets is distorted, and Mallory cannot that easily understand where a certain transaction comes from. In this work, we show that despite broadcast randomization, transactions that have been issued from the same node still, still exhibit similar propagation patterns. And based on these patterns, an adversary can cluster these transactions together. So the plan is as follows. First, we define what do we mean by a transaction propagation pattern. Then we quantify the degree of similarity between these patterns. We then introduce um, how we use a clustering algorithm to link together transactions with similar propagation patterns. And finally, we measure the decrease in anonymity and evaluate our method by clustering our own transactions in various cryptocurrency networks. Let's look at one transaction from Mallory's perspective. She receives this transaction from multiple nodes at, at different IP addresses. So say she first receives a transaction from IP number one, then in 10 milliseconds, she receives the same transaction from IP number two, then from IP number three, and so on. So Mallory can uh, hypothesize that the IP addresses that are closer to the top of this table are likely to be close to the original sender. And the further down we go uh, this table, the less likely it is for the IP address to be one of the sender's neighboring nodes or maybe the sender itself. In order to quantify this intuition, we assign weights to IP addresses for each received transaction. So for each transaction that we receive, we first of all only consider the first n IP addresses that announced it to us. So in this example, n equals five. For all subsequent IP addresses from six and onward, we assign the weight of zero. Then we assign the weight of one to the first IP address that was the first to propagate a transaction to us. Now the question is, how do we assign weights between zero and one for the remaining four IP addresses? We experimented with multiple function families, and in the end, we decided to use this particular function, which describes an S-curve and is parameterized by the parameter k. Uh, crucially, k is chosen for each transaction individually, so that we can reflect our intuition that the difference between timestamps of transaction propagations is more important if they happen closer to 0, 0.0 in time, than if they happen uh, far away from zero. So if we, can, if we consider these three examples, on the first example, the blue line at the bottom, we see that a few propagations happened relatively quickly near point zero. And they are assigned significantly different weights to reflect the fact that it is important at this point. For the second example, where the timestamps are evenly, evenly distributed uh, in this interval, we see that their weights decrease gradually. Finally, in the third example, the green line at the top, we see that if multiple uh, announcements happen within a short period of time, relatively far away from zero, they get approximately the same weight. So using this weight function, we compile a table with all the transactions that we receive. So imagine we received only three transactions, now, here we consider all the IPs that we encountered in our log file, and for each transaction, all the IP addresses except for the first N that announced this transaction get zero weight. In this table, I omitted zeros for clarity, empty cells denote zeros. And the non-zero elements are assigned as per the weight function described above. Now, the question is, how do we compare these weight vectors? In order to quantify the degree of similarity, we use the correlation coefficient between these vectors. And if we calculate these correlation coefficients, uh, we see that the first and the second transactions are more closely related than they are to the third transaction. So as you can see, they have four IP addresses uh, in common, while the third transaction has completely different IP addresses that were the first to announce it. Now, to make this uh, table, this correlation matrix more visual, we use uh, heat map visualization. We assign colors to the cells of this matrix, and the darker is the color, the stronger, the higher is the correlation. 
course, by definition, such matrix has black cells along the main diagonal because each transaction is perfectly correlated with itself. Now, our next task is to uh, cluster these transactions. So for that purpose, we use the spectral co-clustering algorithm implemented in the Python scikit library. And as you can see on this example, taken from the documentation of this library, of this function, um, this is exactly the task that we need to accomplish. This algorithm finds a permutation of rows and columns in a table such that elements that are close to each other get clustered together in rectangular areas along the diagonal. And we expect the data extracted from real cryptocurrency peer-to-peer -peer traffic exhibit a similar behavior as in this example. We, exhibit, uh, we expect that if we apply the clustering algorithm, we will see the clusters along the main diagonal, which ideally would correspond to the issuing nodes. To assess the quality of our method, we use our own transactions. We issue two sets of transactions from two separate nodes. We call them the learning set and the control set. We assume that the algorithm knows that the transaction from the learning set actually belong to the, the same node, and we run the clustering algorithm based on this knowledge. And then we quantify how well the control transactions have been clustered. To quantify the degree of anonymity, we use this measure proposed by Diaz and co-authors. And in our scenario, the task of the adversary is to understand which transactions originate from the control set. This um, anonymity degree varies from zero to one, and the value of one means that the attacker has no additional information and assigns equal probabilities to all the transactions that they are from the control set. And anonymity degree of zero means that the attacker knows exactly which transactions come from the control set. So this coefficient measures the amount of information that the attacker gains by performing the clustering. Now putting all the pieces together, here is the outline of our experiment. We launch three nodes on three different continents to get the best possible view of the network and log all transaction announcements. We issue the learning set and the control set of our own transactions. We assign weights to IP addresses according to the formula. We compile the correlation matrix and apply the clustering algorithm to this matrix. Then we calculate the anonymity degree based on how well our own control set transactions have been clustered. Now, let me present you the results. First, let's look at the Bitcoin testnet. On the Bitcoin testnet, we were able to achieve the anonymity degree of 0 0.63. And as you can see, the correlation matrix actually exhibits the same structure as we expected. We see the square clusters along the main diagonal, and the black lines along the axis denote our own transactions from the control set. As you can see, Many of them, most of them, I would say, fall into the same cluster in the middle, just as we expect. Now, let's take a step back and talk about privacy-focused cryptocurrencies. There are multiple cryptocurrencies that aim to address privacy shortcomings of Bitcoin. They employ various cryptographic and application-level techniques, such as coin mixing, to achieve this goal. But in this experiment, we are interested in the network level of privacy. How well do they, do they protect the transactions on the network level? We performed the same experiment on Zcash and achieved an anonymity degree of 0 0.86. You can see that the picture is a bit less clear than in case of Bitcoin testnet, but we can still see the block diagonal structure and our own transactions uh, at least partially clustered in the square near the main diagonal. It is also important to note that in Zcash, there are two types of addresses, shielded and transparent. And while shielded addresses use the zero-knowledge cryptography to hide transaction details, transparent addresses uh, use no additional privacy-preserving mechanisms compared to Bitcoin transactions. And on this graph, longer black lines indicate transactions that involve shielded addresses, which we'll call shielded transactions for short, 
and short black lines indicate transparent transactions, that is, transactions between transparent addresses. As you can see, both shielded and transparent transactions end up in the same cluster. Uh, this is expected because our method does not use the content of the transaction. It only looks at transaction hashes and timestamps of transaction announcements. Therefore, we see that there may be an attack vector here where an adversary uses blockchain analysis tools developed for Bitcoin to de-anonymize some of the transparent addresses in Zcash and then additionally uses network-based clustering to link them with some of the shielded transactions. Finally, we perform experiments on Monero and Dash. For these cryptocurrencies, we don't issue our own transactions. We just capture some network traffic and apply the clustering algorithm and see what, what it shows. And as you can see, it also exhibits the same block diagonal structure which indicates that our method may be well applicable to these cryptocurrencies as well. In summary, we show in this, um, in this work that peer-to-peer -peer traffic reveals links between transactions issued from one node. We discuss the countermeasure and give some advice for users and developers. From a user's point of view, users should not issue many transactions from the same session or using the same set of so-called entry nodes. Users should probably run their nodes with an increased number of connections and periodically drop and establish connections to blur the networking fingerprint that they leave in the network by broadcasting transactions. From the development standpoint, um, it, it is maybe worth uh, thinking about implementing stronger broadcast randomization techniques. And here I should also mention two new peer-to-peer -peer protocols for cryptocurrencies, Dandelion and Erlay. While they were not developed explicitly to prevent our attack, they still would prevent it. And uh, the key characteristic that allows them to prevent our attack is that in both these protocols, transactions are initially sent only to outgoing connections. If you recall the picture with Mallory and red connections that she establishes, from the point of view of all the nodes in the network, these are incoming connections. Therefore, Mallory will not gain any advantage and will not gain this early access to the transactions as they appear in the network by establishing many connections. This is the crucial first step of our method. And by breaking this first step, uh, these protocols can prevent our attack. So with that, let me move on to part three, where I will discuss security and privacy of the Lightning Network. This part of the presentation covers chapters six and seven of the thesis, and this is joint work with Pedro Moreno Sanchez and Matteo Murphy from Teuvin. Let's recall the idea of off-chain protocols. The idea is to move most of the transactions off the blockchain so that parties can exchange them quickly without waiting for confirmations and paying the on-chain fees. But we, however, will try to preserve as much as possible the security guarantees of the underlying blockchain. The pros of this approach is, first of all, it enables high throughput, at least theoretically, because the parties should not wait for the next block to appear, don't have to wait. And it requires no modifications to the main protocol, which may be hard to implement and roll out. On the other hand, such protocols introduce new security and privacy challenges, which we aim to address in this work, or at least quantify them. Lightning Network is an example of a payment channel network. So let's uh, talk about how payment channels work in general. Here we have Alice and Bob, and they want to exchange transactions off the chain. So let's divide the slide into the off-chain realm and the on-chain realm. First, Alice opens a payment channel by sending some of her coins into a multi-signature output. These coins now can be spent either by Alice and Bob collaboratively, or by Alice herself after a certain timeout. This second clause is necessary in case Bob fails to cooperate with Alice and Alice can withdraw her coins. Then Alice and Bob can exchange transactions without communicating with the blockchain as quickly as they can. And these transactions distribute the same coins in different proportions between Alice and Bob. So Alice may be assigned nine coins and one coin goes to Bob 
then eight coins go to Alison, two coins go to Bob, and so on. At any point in time, any party may decide to close the channel. In this example, Bob decides to close the channel. He takes the last transaction, signs it, and broadcasts it to the blockchain. As a result, Alice gets her seven coins and Bob gets three coins. Note that Alice can withdraw her seven coins immediately, but Bob must wait for a certain timeout. This is necessary to give Alice the opportunity to dispute this channel closure in case it was malicious. So if Bob is trying to use any previous uh, channel state to close the channel, essentially stealing from Alice, then Alice can uh, punish Bob by taking all the money from the channel. This mechanism is the critical building block of the Lightning Network that enables uh, its secure functioning. It is expensive to open channels between every pair of users because of the on-chain fees and the confirmation times. Therefore, the idea is to leverage paths of payment channels. In this example, Alice wants to pay Charlie using channels uh, between Alice and Bob and Bob and Charlie. She sends 101 coins to Bob and Bob forwards 100 coins to Charlie, taking one coin as a service fee. Of course, the key challenge in such protocols is atomicity. Uh, Bob must not be able to run away with Alice's coins without forwarding them to Charlie. Lightning solves the atomicity problem using hash time-locked contracts, or HTLCs. HTLCs are conditions encoded in the Bitcoin script language, which um, encode the following. Coins go to Bob if, if Bob shows a pre-image of a hash before a certain timeout, otherwise they go back to Alice. So this is how a multi-channel payment in the Lightning Network operates. First, Charlie generates a random number R and sends the hash of this number to Alice. Then Alice initiates the creation of a series of HTLCs between herself and Bob and between Bob and Charlie. Then Charlie uses the number R to redeem the coins from Bob. And now Bob can use the same number R to redeem the coins from Alice. Here we can see that either all of the channels get updated or none of them are updated. The Latin network uses source routing. This means that the sender determines the route towards the receiver. Lightning nodes gossip about channels and their availability for routing and their routing policies. Based on this information, each node compiles a local view of the network. Based on this local view, each node chooses a route for each transaction. If a payment fails, then the sender tries sending it along another route and so on until one route succeeds. In this work, we study Lightning's security, privacy, and throughput. In particular, we first quantify uh, the effects of three previously described attacks on Lightning. What do they depend on? And we run some simulations to estimate their probability depending on various factors. Then we analyze a limitation on handing of concurrent payments in Lightning. And finally, we describe a related denial of service attack vector. Let's start with describing some of the attacks that we consider. The first one is the value privacy attack. Here, an attacker wants to know how much is being transacted. And it is not difficult for on-path adversaries because the amounts are sent in plain text. Second, we have the relationship anonymity attack where an attacker learns who pays to whom. This is also um, easy because all the HTLCs along a payment path use the same hash value. So if the attacker controls multiple nodes along the path, they can correlate this same hash value. Finally, in the wormhole attack, the attacker controls two nodes along the payment path, and the victim here is the honest node in the middle. the victim. The victim node loses the fees and also incurs the opportunity cost of the capital locked up in the channels because this payment from the point of view of the victim is failed, therefore capital is locked until timeouts expire. We ask the question, how likely is an attack to succeed? It depends on the type of the attack, 
the payment amount, and which nodes are compromised. And in this work, we aim to quantify these effects based on real lightning snapshots. Here's how we do it. We assume that a certain subset of nodes is compromised. Then we generate a random sender and receiver and find all paths suitable for a given payment amount between them. Then we see how many of these paths are vulnerable to each of the attacks that we consider. Averaging the results across many random runs of the experiment, we arrive at the final estimated probability of an attack succeeding. Imagine an example. We have Alice and Bob. They have multiple paths between them. Uh, if a path contains no malicious nodes, it is safe. This path is vulnerable to the value privacy attack, but not to the other two attacks that we consider. This path is vulnerable to the value privacy attack and the relationship anonymity attack. And the fourth path is vulnerable to all the three attacks. If we compile the results in a table, we can conclude that 75% of paths are vulnerable to value privacy, 50% to relationship anonymity, and 25% to warm call attack. So let's look at the results, which are similar in form, but derived from real world lightning data. First, consider the scenario where the highest degree nodes are compromised, that is, nodes with the highest number of adjacent channels. In each of these graphs, on the x axis, we have the payment amount in Satoshi's, note the logarithmic scale, and on the y axis, we have the probability of uh, an attack succeeding. If we look at the left graph first, we see that for the value privacy attack, the probability of an attack is increasing as we increase the number of malicious nodes, and it, it increases pretty quickly. Already with five nodes compromised, we have around 50% probability of attack for any payment amount. Now, this pattern is similar for the other two attacks, but the probability increases more slowly. So it is harder for an attacker to perform the relationship anonymity attack and even harder to perform the wormhole attack. Now we consider the second scenario. Uh, so we add the second row of graphs to this, uh, to this slide. And now we consider highest capacity nodes compromised, which means that the nodes with the highest number of coins locked in their adjacent channels are compromised. Again, we see that the pattern is similar. However, if we compare these graphs column by column, we see that for an attacker, it is more beneficial to attack highest degree nodes as opposed to highest capacity nodes. Because for the highest capacity nodes being compromised, the probability of success increases more slowly. Finally, we consider random nodes compromised. And here, as you can see, the probability of an attack succeeding is very close to zero, essentially for all, uh, for all numbers of compromised nodes. This means that for an attacker, it doesn't make much sense to try to compromise just random nodes because random nodes are very unlikely to take part in routing some random payments. Instead, an attacker has the incentive to target highly connected or highly capitalized nodes. We observe a trade-off between connectivity and privacy. On the one hand, pathfinding algorithms usually optimize for shorter paths and highly liquid paths and well-connected nodes. This decreases the probability of a payment failure. However, if Alice routes a payment to Bob through the orange path, for example, which goes through an orange node, very well connected and well capitalized, this may be a target for attackers. On the other hand, Alice may try to route the same payment through a longer path going through some smaller nodes and channels on the periphery of the network. This may be better from the privacy standpoint, but the payments may fail more often. Finally, let's discuss concurrency in the Lightning Network. Lightning channels may hold multiple unresolved HTLCs at the same time. However, channel parties must always be able to dispute malicious channel closures, and these dispute transactions would include all unresolved HTLCs. Because Bitcoin implies a certain limit on the size of a transaction in bytes, this means that a Lightning channel can support at most 966 HTLCs concurrently. We call this restriction the HTLC limit. Consider an example. If we have a channel with 1 million Satoshis, 
and it already has 966 HDLCs, which are unresolved of 1,000 satoshis each, then another HDLC cannot be added, despite the fact that the capacity is not yet depleted. Therefore, there are actually two limiting factors for lightning throughput, the channel capacity and the HDLC limit. And which one of the more important is more important depends on the payment amount. We divide the payments into three categories, depending on their amount. First of all, for payments below the so-called dust limit, no HDLCs are created at all. So such small payments are not relevant here. Then for payments between the dust limit and what we call the borderline amount, approximately 2,700 satoshis, HDLC limit is more important. And for larger payments, capacity becomes more important. Based on historical lightning snapshots, we have tracked the evolution of the borderline amount um, since the beginning of the lightning network. And we observe that it has been growing in 2018, and then it has been relatively stable since early 2019. We have also calculated um, how many channels are affected by the HTLC limit. We call a channel affected if it could handle more payments concurrently if the HTLC limit didn't exist. We see that for very small payments, which are just above the dust limit, nearly 50% of the channels are affected. And the share of affected channels has been raising, but again, it has been pretty stable since 2019. Finally, there is a related denial of service attack vector where an attacker can block a channel by sending many small payments. So essentially, every channel can be blocked uh, with a constant capital commitment of 527,000 satoshis, or around 60 US dollars. Compared to similar attacks described in the literature earlier, this attack does not require to have as much capital as the victim channel has. So especially for large channel, this method of blocking channels may be very beneficial for an attacker. And of course, such attacks may be amplified by using multi-hop payments. So in summary, we have shown that privacy attacks on the Lightning Network are possible with only very few nodes compromised. And it is important for an attacker, most of all, to try to compromise highly connected nodes. This scenario may be not so far-fetched because there is one entity under the pseudonym Alan Big which controls a large share of lightning channels and of lightning uh, capacity. We also have shown that the throughput in the lightning network is not only limited by the channel capacity, but also by the number of concurrent payments that a lightning channel can handle. This is relevant for micropayments below approximately 30 US cents, which is one of the major use cases for Lightning, at least as envisioned in the original Lightning paper. And there is a related denial of service vector that allows an adversary to block any channel by sending many small payments, but not finalizing them. So in summary, this is the list of publications that I co-authored during my PhD studies. And the ones that I presented to you today are highlighted in bold. Um, so let me just, uh, on a more lighthearted note, uh, share this uh, beautiful meme on the right, because it reflects perfectly the evolution of my own uh, thinking and my own interests in this space. So starting from Bitcoin, I fell into this Bitcoin rabbit hole in 2013. Then I learned about this many new cryptocurrencies and blockchains and was fascinated by this diversity. Then I narrowed down my focus uh, to essentially Bitcoin, Ethereum, and privacy-focused cryptocurrencies, exemplified here by Monero, which seemed, these three areas seemed to me the most interesting and technically sound. And finally, I would say two years ago, I decided to focus all of my efforts in the Bitcoin ecosystem, which includes Lightning, because um, as far as I can tell, and um, as far as I can understand, Bitcoin still has the highest chance of implementing this initial vision of neutral, digital, censorship-resistant money. This vision inspires me, and I'm planning to continue working in the space, and I hope that uh, my research helps bring this vision a little bit closer to reality. 
So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sergey, for the very nice presentation. Um, just in time, 45 minutes. Uh, we start with a question and answer session, and of course, we start with a question for jury. Um, traditionally, we start with the external um, committee members. So, who would like to to start? I can ask you questions, ready, so I can start. Okay. Yeah, uh, oh, you go next, Patty. Um, so, I, I'm most interested in hearing you offer some comparisons with um, related work. I think uh, you did a really excellent job of explaining the background and fundamentals of uh, uh, the Bitcoin and Lightning Network, but didn't say very much about the prior work that you know proceeded down some kind of related avenues. So, starting with network analysis, um, you know, you, you presented how your technique can use uh, can accomplish clustering by observing like. Uh, the timing and the footprint that transactions leave on the network as they propagate. Uh, but there have been several other papers that have, you know, all, also at a very high level done something similar to that. So, I mean, can you compare and contrast those or offer any quantitative comparison? Sorry, could you repeat the last part of the question? Yeah, could you just offer a comparison, like uh, ideally qualitative and quantitative? Like, how is it different uh, uh, what you're doing compared to related work that looks at network? Okay, you mean the part of the uh, the clustering part, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, there are uh, there, there were certain works which are relatively close to to the one that I presented, and in particular, my work is partially based on the work uh, by from our lab actually, Berkov and Pustogarov, the anonymizing clients in Bitcoin's P two P network from twenty fourteen, I believe. Uh, but uh, I kind of expanded upon that approach. And essentially, like the first novel thing that we did is that we applied it to privacy focused cryptocurrencies, which has not been done before. Also, from the uh, like compared to other um, related work, uh, our like novel part of the method was the way that we invented this weight function. And we not only considered the first relayer heuristic, but, all, but we considered multiple first IP addresses and weighted them for each transaction individually. So this has not been done previously, and this allowed us to, as, as we believe, to achieve better, better results for clustering. Do you, uh, can you quantify that? You said you believe it that it's better. I would kind of expect a comparison between prior approaches and new approach. So uh, it's, um, I mean, uh, it's uh, a bit hard to compare, uh, like it's a little bit apples and oranges because the previous work, the kind of, the problem statement was formulated a bit differently. And in the previous work, what they tried to do is that they tried to link the transactions to the IP addresses, whereas we were uh, like taking this problem from another angle and we were trying to cluster the transactions together. Like our, our main goal was to link transactions to transactions rather than to link transactions to IP addresses. So. I would say it's not kind of directly comparable. It's a similar problem, and we partially used the kind of the approach taken in that work, but applied it to a little bit different uh, problem statement. And that, that logic, I don't quite agree with because I mean, if they are, it sounds like what you're saying is that their goal was to attach to uh, IP addresses, which is say stronger. You know, to say these transactions are clustered and in particular go to this IP address. Whereas you are only interested in a subset of that, which is to say these are clustered. We don't necessarily know which IP address is there. However, it would seem like you could use the prior method to, you know, cluster and just ignore, like it's aiming at a stronger statement. So it's like comparing smaller apples to larger apples. And you know, even I would, uh, uh, and like what you said, you're you're including. I mean, in a nutshell, you're including more information to do this kind of clustering. So I would think that you could say, like, here's how much more detection or correct clustering we get by considering multiple IP addresses, not just the first one, uh, compared to you know extrapolating from prior work and just considering the first one. Mm. I mean, I agree. I, I agree with the question, and um, uh, not that I can like 
answer this directly right now because uh, we don't i mean we don't have the direct comparison so uh, i can't can't uh, produce it right now but that's uh, that, that's a fair question we we're not trying to directly kind of um to present our work as a direct improvement rather than a little bit different problem statement with different approach uh, with different approach and applied to not only to bitcoin but to other currencies as well and also, by the way, another thing that uh, may be also relevant here is that that previous work in 2014 was done when Bitcoin was using trickling as the broadcast randomization mm -hmm. method, which we described in the work. But our experiments were done in 20, 2018 when Bitcoin updated to diffusion, that is generating a random delay for each propagation individually, which was expected to bring better, kind of better protection against these attacks but uh, we were able to perform them nonetheless. I mean, at least uh, the results that we obtained indicate that it's not an absolute protection. I had a small clarification question uh, on the weight function slide. I didn't catch a slide number for it, but it was kind of really on mm -hmm. where you illustrated the weight function. I just wanted to know what that, ca what that came from. Was that an, an example or from a particular experiment? No, th this this one is yeah. just artificial data, which okay. just illustrates how this how this works for different vectors of timestamps that we could encounter in the data. Okay. Uh, I had a for the Lightning Network um, attacks. I had a similar question as the first one. Like, could you comment on what's the most closely related work, and then what the distinct contribution is here to that? Like if we talk about the part about this part, uh, here I'm not immediately aware of the work that immediately kind of relates to our work. So I think we were the first to quantify these effects on different attacks. If we talk about the HTLC limit issue, then uh, it is not 100% no, novel. So it was kind of briefly mentioned in the specs or in some blog post or forum, just kind of as a side note. Uh, we described it more thoroughly and we estimated the actual effect of this limitation. Also, concurrently to our research, another paper um, with Aviv Zohar as one of the co-authors, and I don't remember the first author, they published the paper on archive this summer, approximate, last summer, approximately the same time as we did, uh, where they study this limitation and also quant quant quantify its effects. So this kind of concurrent work. Okay. Uh, the last question I have before yielding is on um, the wormhole attack. And I think that I'm in the minority of this because I've had kind of conversations with this. And I think that I never feel like I get the wormhole attack, and, but I've never quite convinced anyone that it you know, of the following. But I'll try it out for any. So sorry in advance if this is just a, a picking at something that I'm just in the wrong at this. I can't understand why the wormhole attack is really an attack and not just something that is fair game for an attacker to be able to do. So you've outlined the two kinds of damages. One is capital being locked up and the other is fees not being given. But if the attacker really controls both of those nodes in any world where Alice has you know, good information about how to route payments, Alice should just choose to route between the, you know, directly to the red nodes uh, to Bob. So, I mean, there's no guarantee that says if you try to offer service that people will take you up on offering service. And if you're, you're providing links that are redundant, then you wouldn't expect anyone to give you any fees because you're not providing a necessary service. And here it looks, you know, like there's no way to get to the, between the red nodes, except by going through the middle node. <clears throat> but that seems like it's only because the red nodes just, you know, presented themselves as not having that. So I can see how the middle node might expect to get fees and then not, but in a sense, they don't deserve fees because they aren't providing additional connectivity that doesn't exist with the rest of the network anyway. And then for the capital lockout, anytime you have a connection to someone, uh, like the red node to the middle node, you could make a, the red node could just make a payment and, you know, not send it and make the denial of service anyway. So even without the wormhole attack, you might not get fees and you might have your capital locked up by, you know, malicious incoming nodes. Okay, so let me comment on that uh, one one. So, uh, okay, so if I understand correctly, the first point is that it, it's not really an attack because, um, yeah, let, let, let me rephrase it. 
uh, because if the victim doesn't get the fees, it is somewhat fair because from the sender's point of view, the, the payment is delivered and the sender paid the same fees as they were expecting to pay and everything is fine from their point of view. And this is like, this is true. I mean, uh, I also am not fully kind of on board with this definition of form call attack as an attack because the sender and the receiver may not even notice that something happens. On the other hand, uh, it still is somewhat kind of out of protocol behavior that may damage the incentives. And um, yeah, I should also notice here that the red nodes, they may not share a channel between them because they are controlled by one party. They trust each other internally. Therefore, they can perform this kind of out of band exchange of secrets without actually committing capital to do so. So it's kind of, they use this advantage that they are part of the same entity. So one may look at this as just an optimization, but on the other hand, if we want nodes to join and to route payments and to earn fees, uh, this is somewhat, uh, so somewhat bad, I would say, because it may damage the incentives. And on the second part about the capital being locked up, I think there is a difference here because, um, I mean, of course, if your counterparty wants to perform a denial of service attack on you, then it can just do the same, not resolve the payment. But normally as the payments flow, they usually, like if no one is malicious in the route, the HDSCs get resolved within seconds and the HDSCs are not kind of left hanging. But on the other hand, if I send a payment and it's not redeemed from the other side, like the victim nodes experiences, then this capital is locked up until its timeout expires, which may be many hours or even days, which, uh, I mean, this is basically the same denial of service attack, but performed as a part of just another uh, optimization that these red nodes perform. And the victim node just, I mean, has nothing to do with it. But I mean, let me, let me put it this way. Suppose that the wormhole attack did not take place. But this topology is still present. The red node could make a transaction to the other red node and then lock up the capital in exactly the same way just by not resolving the payment until such time as the time lock expires, which would have exactly the same effect to the middle node. It wouldn't make use of the wormhole attack, as it would be a separate payment. But it seems like it would have exactly the same. I mean, if the red nodes wanted to perform the denial of service attack, they could do that. Uh, but here it is kind of happening automatically, in a sense, as just part of a larger, larger picture. So, in a sense, so technically, a technically it's kind of a superset of the denial of service attack. We can look at it like that. Okay, I think I'm good with uh, those responses. Um, okay, I'm good with questions. Cool. I, I can ask some questions if you want. Um, so I, I can start with the network analysis section. What I was more worried, like, so you basically clarified one of the points I wanted to ask was what is it trying to link? So it's not trying to link IP addresses, it's trying to link transactions to transactions. And that's why, you know, the little chart show, that, yeah, that, like, that heat map, for example. One thing you didn't really talk about was more like um, false positives. So what if someone else sends a transaction, what's the likelihood that it may come up as a false positive in this map? Um, you know, so obviously you've done uh, 21 transactions, but if, what if there was a 22nd that, that popped up? What's the likelihood that may end up as a false positive in this heat map? Um, just wanted to get some comments on that. Yeah, I, th I think there are certain, I mean, there are certain numbers in, in the paper and in the thesis, but in general, we, um, I mean, by false positive, you mean that other transactions will end up in like our cluster, so to say? Yeah, exactly. So what, what my understanding would be that if someone's connected to a similar set of nodes as me, then if they send a transaction, then it may pop up as a false positive that looks like one of my transactions. You know, if, we're all, if I'm connected to the Alice Bob Carline, they're connected to Bob Carline div, then we share two connections in common. If they send a transaction at roughly the same time, you know, what's the likelihood is it may look like a false positive that we're the same person? Yeah, that's that's that, that's a fair question. I uh, don't think I can answer it precisely because I don't think we calculated this specifically. What we did calculate is for a specific number of our own transactions, how how many like how many ended up in in this cluster, 
Right? First of all, we have the problem where there may be multiple clusters which kind of look like our clusters. So it also took some kind of um, uh, some kind of uh, tuning, fine tuning the parameters to make the algorithm actually uh, kind of. On the one end of the spectrum, you, you have each transaction in its own cluster. On the other end of the spectrum, everything is just one cluster. So somewhere in between is the optimum amount. So if we fine tune the parameters in such a way that our control set transactions actually end up in one cluster, more or less, then we can calculate how many like extra transactions they uh, this cluster also contains. But we 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 didn't do this. Um, what we didn't do is that we didn't try to deliberately connect to the same or the similar set of nodes and try to uh, assess the results of this. So this may be interesting as a separate separate exercise, but it's not something that we've done here. Yeah, so um, what you could probably do is, um, I mean, in the thesis, you could write some thoughts around this. I think that'd be quite cool to add in. There's a paper by Sergi Degado called Transaction, uh, Pro uh, Transaction Proof that gives you the hot name of the overview of the task net topology that would give you some data to know at least you know how many nodes are connected to you. you know it gives you the the estimated topology of all nodes connected to the other nodes and you know all their little webs and you know spider-like stuff that may give you some intuition on what the likely false positive rate might be you know what's the likelihood the two nodes are connected to the same 80 percent of other peers um so that may be a good starting point for that and that's actually what i wanted to ask next as well with, with the network analysis um could that be reused do you also work out the network topology so as i mentioned in transaction pro the surgery was able to distinguish if a node is connected to a b or c for the entire network by abusing an orphan transaction bug in core um could you do something similar with the network analysis well let me think um the difference compared to that work is definitely that we're not trying to abuse any kind of weird feature of core we like from the technical standpoint we were using a specialized client developed by Ivan Postogarov previously and modified further by me which establishes many parallel connections so that um, a transaction is propagated to us but we didn't kind of uh, exploit anything core related specifically so um let me think for a sec. So the question is whether we can understand if two nodes have a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Exactly. Could you have a rough? Could you have like a rough estimate of the network topology based on this technique? I don't think you'll get it as exact as Sergi did because it's a bit blurry. But maybe you can have a rough cloud-like thing. Like these is the, these are sort of the clusters that pop up on the network. These many clusters actually exist on the network. Yeah, probably we can gather some information. We can gather maybe the information, like something along the lines of, okay, um, the like this set of IP addresses often appears together. Like if this transaction is broadcast quickly from IP addresses A, then it is also likely that it appears from IP B, and therefore they may be related somehow. But um, it's not clear this like this relation that we can probably extract somehow whether it means that these nodes are connected to each other or that they are connected to some third node and they are kind of part of the entry set of this third node. So yeah, it's not it's not, it's not clear it's, immediately. Yeah, I guess the I mean the, the the intermediary connection might be difficult. I mean, I guess one question I like the answer is. You know, how many transactions do fewer broadcast to the Ethereum network? How many transactions is blockchain.com broadcast to the Ethereum or to the Bitcoin network? And it sounds like this technique could give you some idea towards that, assuming they're using one or, you know, some set of nodes on the network to broadcast. Yeah, we partially um, go to towards this direction a little bit in the adjacent uh, chapter of the thesis and adjacent work where we study mobile wallets turns out that most of mobile wallets use just some centralized server or a couple of servers to broadcast transactions. And it kind of seems like we were able to capture some of that. So um, I think it is technically possible. It's most like, I think it's pro it's possible to do it 
much better than we did, but we kind of show that it's somewhat somewhat feasible to uh, to understand where these transactions come from. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be cool. Like maybe you can mention something like that in your thesis, like future work, and like how can this work be carried on forward in the future? I th I think that would be interesting. I I like to know how many big parties are responsible for broadcasting most of the transactions. Um, my next question is actually this is more of a comment to the related work for the Lightning Network stuff. So from what I remember, Jordy has a paper at CCS where they have used the bug LND, the brig value privacy. Um, I think that's what they did in the paper. I would double check that. That could be some related work. Another one, there's a paper by Sergi Degado again. He's been quite active, I guess, this year. Um, doing Trying to also break value privacy using a similar technique for that, for what you did in the paper. So I'd also look at his work and maybe try to compare that. Um, and that's also with Haroon. Um, there's a, that's just a comment just from related work that you can look at. My, my last comment really, my last question is in the HTLC limit work. So obviously what you're doing is you're at a Bitcoin transaction can only have, I think you said it was 977 or 577 HTLCs before the transaction is over 100 kilobytes and it can no longer get into blockchain. And um, one thing you could compare that to is the idea of rapid micropayments. And that's implemented in Interledger, and there was a good talk by Dan Robinson about why HTLC is evil, and he proposes rapid macro payment. You must you must be aware of the talk already. I mean, I remember the title, and I remember that I heard his one of his podcast appearances, but I remember very few details right now because it was oh, okay. a couple of years so, ago. Yeah, so the idea is really straightforward. So in HTLC, obviously, you send the coins forward, and then you unlock backwards. In the rapid macro payment approach, you basically say, well, why don't I just send lots of tiny little macro payments forward? And if one of them get lost, then I've lost, you know, 500 sats, but then I just maybe close the connection with my peer. Uh, so that way you don't have any lock up, you know, you're just sending all these coins across, but you end up, you may end up burning some of your money because, you know, your current party doesn't redeem one of the payments. Um, that seems like it would be a countermeasure to the HTLC limit problem. And I'd be interested to know the issues around that, you know, is that actually not viable because Maybe you could DOS that and make them lose lots of SATs. You know, no one wants to lose their SATs. But uh, was this idea proposed for Bitcoin specifically, or just in general for payment channels? In general for payment channels, this could this, is, this can easily be applied on Bitcoin because um, there's there's no script, there's no special script for this. All you're doing is sending 500 SATs from Alice Bob Carline, and you just assume that gets sent. You know, there's no winding back. And when that gets sent, then you send the next one, then you send the next one, then. You, and what you end up with is like hundreds and thousands of transfers to make up the full amount. You know, just rapid micropayments. Um, be pretty cool to see how that compares to the HTLC limit problem. I've not seen many people write about it. I just know that's a proposed idea, and I don't really know the trade-offs for doing that. Obviously, there's the network overhead, but I don't know about the the risks of your SATs. Cool. Thank you. Um, there are the comments I have for the presentation. I have some for the thesis as well from the other topics, but I can ask those later, I guess. Um, I can let someone else take the floor. Thanks, Patrick. I may maybe continue. Um, so actually to, to continue on your proposal, the, these micropayments, um, uh, I think one of the issues, if you do these, uh, if um, these very small Satoshi payments, you have to set some kind of a threshold, right? At which you decide now I'm not no longer gonna try another Satoshi this way, right? So, and this this threshold is kind of a magic parameter. I'm not really sure how to quantify what's the optimal one. Um, and if the adversary knows about this threshold, then he can he can game you as well, right? So it's a becomes a game theoretic game. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, pretty interesting question. Okay, I have a few questions. So thanks a lot, Sergey, for your presentation. Um, Thank you. Um, I really like the network analysis that you that you presented. Um, I've actually done some of this myself also in 2015, uh, not on Bitcoin, uh, but on BitMessage, which is a P2P network where you're send it's basically email um, with a P2P network similar to Bitcoin, and you're encrypting an email with the public key of the recipient and it has like an address just like a Bitcoin node has an address. Um, and the idea is that you conceal kind of from where do you send the message is a P2P network, right? So 
I try to identify very similar to what you did, like you get the top top X um, IP addresses and can we somehow infer the originator of the message? Um, so something I, I, I noticed while doing that is that the number of connections that you establish in the network is quite relevant. And I saw in your thesis that you that you very not, you, you you acted very ethically and very nice uh, by saying that you don't you didn't build up many connections to the network to preserve the the health of the Bitcoin network, right? Because you're you're taking away resources from the light clients if you if you set up too many uh, TCP connections to other nodes. So I think my first question is, how many connections did you actually use? Because I, it was a bit amb ambiguous in the thesis. So was it 50 connections or 1,000 connections? Uh, it was uh, like, depending on the net, like uh, the, if we look at this picture that I'm showing right now, which is probably mm -hmm. the most the most clear one on the test net, then we connected to everything that we that we managed to connect to. And the, um, so basically by default, the nodes allow up to 117 incoming connections. And we tried to, at least on testnet, try to occupy all of them. Some like some special nodes are obviously, this setting is overrun and they allow more connections. And we uh, didn't, as far as I remember, we didn't try to occupy all of their connections, but uh, we could occupy the majority of connections on testnet. But on, on Bitcoin, we uh, limited the number of nodes that we connect to. So on testnet, there were at the time of our experiments, as far as I remember, somewhere around 1,000 nodes, or maybe like 900, something of that nature. But on Bitcoin mainnet, there are uh, around 10,000 nodes only with that accept incoming connections. So um, yeah, so basically on, on testnet, we established, say, we try to establish 117. It's not always possible, but in like reality, per, per, this is this is per peer, right? And this is not like the the accumulative. Yeah, ex things. exactly. Yeah, the, the important point that I didn't go much into in the presentation because of lack of time is that if you just establish one connection to a peer, it doesn't help you much because that's where this broadcast randomization plays a role. And you are if you are not randomly selected for a new transaction, then you will learn about it too late from other nodes. And to overcome this, we established many parallel connections. So, so we established, I don't know, 50, 80, 100 connections to the same node. And because Bitcoin Core does not allow us to do so, we use a specialized client software, which was developed as part of previous research in our lab and modified by me for other networks like, like uh, Zcash Dash. Uh, Monero is another story, by the way. Monero, I had to modify the implementation itself. Uh, but in, in any case, we establish many parallel connections to each node. And therefore, if, say, if I am one of the nodes, one of the victim nodes, I have like five genuine connections and 100 malicious connections. I flip this coin, diffusion, and with a very high probability, I will choose one of the attacker's connections. So attacker will learn very quickly about a new transaction. So this is an important point, mm -hmm. which yeah, may I mean, not I be... Yeah. I would be I would be curious to to know like quantitatively how how much does the the privacy according to your to your your definition of privacy decreases when the adversary's um, overall connections increase right What's the relationship here That would be quite quite cool because um, I I mean you can modify the Bitcoin Core client I did that I got like ten thousand connections with one node only right that that's possible um, in in total. Um, and the good thing is, if you net, if you like, if you want to build the strongest possible adversary for this game, then probably I would it would nest would would be necessary to build such a client that connects to the majority of the network, because what you can also do then is to accept a lot of incoming connections, and then the um, then the then what you mentioned Dandelion and Erle, they they would prevent your techniques from from working just because of the fact that. Uh, your technique works only on out like on on nodes accepting incoming connections, right? But if you're if you're a very well connected adversary in the network, and your 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 address is basically being propagated through these address messages in Bitcoin, then uh, nodes will start to connect to you quite a lot, and um, I, it might still be possible even with with uh, a lay on or the then what's the name again? The network, yeah. 
I mean, I, I'm just guessing, right? I think it would be nice future work. Yeah. Yeah, agree. Agree. Have you looked at like what what's the advantage an ISP could have in that game? Like, like basically corporations with uh, routing access or BGP access. Uh, we didn't look at it specifically. I'm aware of an early work about the BGP hijacking and its effects on Bitcoin. I think it was mm -hmm. from like 2013 or something. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, at, at, le at least the ISP has probably more just more resources and can understand who is running Bitcoin nodes in their network. Um, not that I can come to an like, immediate answer to this. But I mean, an, an ISP probably knows whether it's coming from its autonomous system or an external one, right? Which already helps, and uh, they're not that many. Uh, yeah, so might be might be interesting. Okay, cool. Um, then for part two, so for the for the Lightning Network, I I was just wondering. Um, uh, so the um, to what extent would you say that the the privacy properties of of the Lightning Network depend on its topology, like on on how decentralized or centralized, like decentralized in the terms of uh, non-star topology, it is like. To what degree do you think that matters? Does it at all? Uh, I think it matters quite a lot. I mean, if you look at this graph, for example, so if we imagine that say Alan Big is malicious and is trying to denonymize all the nodes we basically can see that it knows like most of the amounts and in many cases knows the kind of can relate different HTLCs. So yeah, in general, I have a feeling that if we have this star-like topology, then uh, lots of things get uh, dependent on the central nodes. And despite the fact that we use onion routing and blah, 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 and no one can actually know 100% whether they are the first or the last or in the middle. But <laughs> based on the topology, I think there are works about this that uh, just by exclusion, if you control large nodes and an income and payment comes to you, you can do some maths on this graph and by excluding parts of the, of the graph kind of localize the payment based on its amount and its map routing properties and so on. So uh, for me, it seems like a big challenge for the Lightning Network, how to incentivize, uh, incentivize it to be more decentralized and with more, more nodes. Maybe it will be kind of an oligopolic system in a sense, like we'll have, I don't know, a handful of large node providers, maybe not complete mesh topology because um, I'm not sure it's feasible. I haven't done calculations, but just have a feeling it's maybe not feasible. But uh, concentrating power in just a few operators, I think, would be harmful for privacy. Mm -hmm. And here again, it would be interesting to quantify, right? To what degree? Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's it's tricky to measure decentralization. Um, I mean, you could use some some graph metrics, I guess. But uh, yeah, it would be not interesting to understand this relationship. Um, yeah, this may be the first step towards this direction. So it's, I mean, lots of things can be done uh, from here. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I have a few questions for the thesis, but yeah, we can mm -hmm. maybe uh, I let the, somebody else first. Okay. I guess I can continue with a round of questions from uh, the external panel. Uh, so many technical questions have already been asked. So first of all, thanks a lot for the, for the presentation. Very nice. Um, so you propose countermeasures in uh, the different parts of the thesis. So specifically both for the network analysis part as well as for the, let's say, Lightning Network analysis part. Uh, things like, for instance, in the case of the network, like you suggested, could help, uh, I don't know, to drop uh, connections to randomly chosen entry nodes, establish new ones, or maybe uh not to, to broadcast sensitive transactions within a short period so these are all like techniques uh, to improve the situation in the current uh, status let's say on the bitcoin network so i have two questions related to that so let's focus on network analysis first um is there any way to quantify how effective these countermeasures are so assuming you implement them and the attacker is aware of them um can we somehow assess how effective the countermeasures you propose uh, are from a quantitative point of view? Uh, 
it is uh, technically it is possible. Uh, not um, we have not done it in this work. What I can say is that um, if just just from a general observation of how our method works, if a user establishes a completely new session for each new transaction, that would mean that our method is completely uh, defeated because as nodes are chosen at random from all the Bitcoin nodes, more or less, then this fingerprint is just re-established. The question is, um, like a more meaningful question may be how, um, if we implement this countermeasure, for example, every hour we drop a random connection, we establish a new one, how many connections do we actually have to drop to achieve this or that level of protection? And I, uh, I don't have an, um, a ready answer yet, but this is the question that we uh, can ask, of course. Um, yes, uh, so you didn't uh, think about to quantify them yet. No, not, not, in, not, in, this, uh, not in this work. Mm -hmm. um, and let's say that uh, if we are open to a fresh redesign of the Bitcoin network, would you see more like uh, um, foundationally, fundamentally different approaches to get the better privacy guarantees, like different topologies, different uh, overlays? Uh, you mean on the networking or a peer to peer layer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so if we are open to a complete fresh redesign, I mean, as far as I understand, these proposal, uh, proposals that I mentioned, Dandelion and Ilay, they um, look kind of what exactly what you described is kind of a fresh redesign mm -hmm. designed specifically for the purposes of the system. And uh, yeah, I have um, the impression that initially the peer to peer protocol was designed a little bit ad hoc. So it was kind of designed based on. Kind of general understanding of gossip networks, but not necessarily um, tailored to the specific needs of a cryptocurrency. And now, 10 years later, when we have a better understanding of what exactly is required and what challenges we can face in this protocol, so these two suggestions seem very reasonable to me, at least from the privacy standpoint. I'm more familiar with uh, Dentalion, I would say, and um, I know that it has certain trade-offs and its implementation in Bitcoin is not being uh, kind of actively uh, actively pursued, as far as I understand. But um, yeah, it seems it, it seems like what what I would uh, expect from a peer to peer protocol specifically for cryptocurrencies is a stronger emphasis on privacy, and maybe trying to specific like mm, okay, like trying to find um, some middle ground between a situation where I connect to nodes completely randomly, just I choose some random subset of, of peers, and then uh, an attacker can establish many nodes and I can connect to the attacker's nodes or attacker can con connect to me. So this is kind of fr fr freedom of connection, which implies certain attacks as we, for example, exploit this kind of freedom that everyone can connect to everyone. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have this, I don't know, tightly controlled network where everyone is, um, you know, KYC and controlled, and I connect just to to you because I know you personally. I know it's your node. It's also not something that we would like to have in a in a cryptocurrency. But somewhere in the middle, there is some optimal solution where an attacker cannot gain a massive advantage by establishing lots of connections. But on the other hand, um, yeah, we don't have to implement additional identification or um, associating nodes with real world identities and so on. So I think Dandelion and Nilay are nice proposal, like uh, sum summarizing this um, thread. Hope to see them implemented or at least some more, some more research in that direction. Okay, um, a different type of question is, uh, um, so you, in, in your thesis, uh, you focused on uh, privacy in the network layer, uh, privacy, of course, in the Lightning Network, uh, let's say, uh, level. 
uh, there are of course the anonymization attacks uh, on the ledger itself so the, anonym the anonymization and the privacy leakages may happen across different layers and uh, people typically have looked at it uh, in isolation uh, did you think about uh, uh, exploring how uh, the anonymization in one layer can improve the anonymization in the other, or how kind of privacy of one layer affects the other, and to give a quantitative assessment of that? Mm. I mean, it surely, uh, it surely is possible. Uh, it's not something that we have done specifically in this work. It is possible, uh, even for future work. Uh, I've definitely seen a recent paper about the Lightning Network, how, like, uh, and if you asked about the relation between zero, like layer zero and layer one, so to say, and there is a uh, recent work about the relationship between zero, uh, layer one and layer two, how they cr can cr cross correlate, co correlate between each other. But basically, as I see it, is that networking layer attacks provide a very meaningful, um, like they help the attacker achieve a very meaningful goal of associating the cryptocurrency activity to IP addresses, which is the bridge towards the real world identities, ISPs, and like physical locations of people. So um, it seems very valuable from an attacker standpoint, not only to, um, to perform blockchain analysis and link transactions to, I don't know, to each other or to accounts on social media or whatnot, but uh, linking them to IP addresses is a separate uh, valuable, valuable insight. So I think it's, um, I think it's beneficial for the attacker. It's not something that we have done uh, so far, but uh, it definitely should be possible. As we exemplified in Zcash, for example, one could take blockchain analysis tool, apply it to transparent transactions, and then use additional network analysis to link them to shield it transactions and shielded addresses. Uh, yeah, that's, that should be possible at least to some extent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, that's it from my side. Thank you. Alex, do you want to continue? Yeah, actually, yeah. Thanks a lot for the very nice presentation. I don't have many questions because I had an opportunity already to ask them. Maybe one question. Uh, I think you came to our lab as a developer, but we are doing a lot of analysis of and crypto analysis and attacks. And maybe we influenced that you also did a lot of attacks and privacy and security kind of analysis in your thesis. But for your future, what do you see that you would be doing more kind of continue this kind of attack uh, profile, vulnerability analysis, or more development and design? Um, I think I would like to do some, a little bit of both. I think I would like to move a little bit into more of, like, try to be a little bit more closely related to the actual process of development of Bitcoin and Lightning, because uh, for now the uh, the attacks that we have developed, they may not be immediately kind of, the Bitcoin developers may not be immediately aware of them and uh, kind of implement countermeasures and so on. But in general, yeah, I would like to continue working on Lightning maybe and on Bitcoin in as far as it is relevant for Lightning. And uh, yeah, ideally I would like not only to invent attacks or to test new attacks, but also to help develop the countermeasures and actual protocol modifications that would help build better, stronger protocols. So this is where I, this is where I see myself going further. Okay, yeah. thank you. So that's all for, from my side. Thank you. Do we have other questions from or re, uh, remarks on the on the document, the report? May, may I ask to uh, make a few minutes break? Well, I, I propose that we just continue since I guess we 
question session will not last for hours anymore, and I guess we, we should be done relatively soon. Um, okay. Well, I just add when one more question from my side. You said somewhere in your report when you talked about these wallet wallets that 99.9 percent .9 of the wallets have issues. Uh, do you use a wallet? Would, which one would you recommend if somebody asks you? Since this is this number is kind of shocking. You mean the uh, specifically the mobile wallets? Yeah, the mobile wallets that you an analyze in. Why well, I don't remember the the yeah, for, section. Uh, uh, for me, like I, I don't actually use uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies that that often. To be honest, it's not that I have a, an immediate use case for them. But uh, looking at the wallet landscape, the one that I uh, that stands out for me is called simply Bitcoin Wallet for Android, and it's called that way because, as far as I understand, it was really the first Bitcoin Wallet for Android, and there was no need to like distinguish it from others, uh, just based on the fact that it is very old project it's built by enthusiasts as far as i know again it's not backed by any business and from the networking standpoint again that we pay attention in this work it really does connect to peers in the peer-to-peer -peer network because one thing that annoys me a bit about mobile wallets is most of them do not even try to participate in the peer-to-peer -peer network as peers they just trust some server to broadcast their transactions so this wallet now, as far as I can understand, doesn't do that. There may be others that don't do that. But of course, like for very high profile, I don't know, for very large value transactions, I cannot give definite recommendations because like making sure that nothing goes wrong for a very large stakes involves actually analyzing all of the code and deployment process and so on. But just from kind of uh, perspective of someone who just wants to be more or less more or less clear this is what i would prefer there's also electrum which is a very old project it's most focused on desktop but they have an android application which is derived by taking the the same backend and applying a graphical user interface on top of it but um, i think i've used it once and it was not that successful it's something something either crashed or didn't work i'm not sure what so i think mobile is not their main focus uh, but yeah, Bitcoin Core, of course, is kind of the choice for the enthusiasts on desktops, which mm, demands lots of space for blocks and so on. Mm, so yeah, I would be a little bit wary of wallets, which are very like shiny and bright and backed by a large venture capital investment, because the incentives are aligned in such a way that they kind of have an incentive to derive value from analyzing their users' data and uh, give returns to their investors, which is not the healthiest dynamic in this particular sphere. Okay, when uh, in chapter 10 you talk about Findle and chapter 11 on, on smart check, uh, which are on, on, on smart contracts, now we have a large financial industry in Luxembourg. Is there any interest from their side? Did they get in contact with you or do they know about you? Or I um, imagine that, that should be interesting for them also, right? It's kind of um, a little bit counterintuitive as far as I can understand, because the, you know, the financial industry and blockchains, they seem kind of all, all about the same thing, but actually mm, they're quite different because uh, the blockchains, at, le at least the flavor of blockchains that I am most interested in, like open blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, they are the ones uh, who are trying to disrupt this financial industry that is mostly present in Luxembourg. And I'm not sure that the key problem for like the traditional financial industry is uh, describing their contracts in the most concise and machine readable way. Um, to be honest, I'm not that kind of aware of what what these guys are doing, but as far as I can see from afar, uh, they are very much concerned with things like regulations and making everything GDPR compliant and um, all things of that nature, getting the banking licenses and so forth. Then the IT systems, I mean, uh, they develop their own IT systems, obviously, but the challenges that they have to solve are a little bit different to what is interesting to me, at least in the blockchain space. 
Um, so I don't see that much of an intersection there, but if they, I mean, if they're ready to, to kind of collaborate or cooperate in some way, maybe worth, worth considering. So not, don't, don't have a definitive answer to that. Okay. Um, are there other questions from the panel members? Just a very short one um, for for chapter eleven. So you, the smart uh, the security testing tool. Do you have any insights? So you analyze like over four thousand verified contracts, right? Um, and I suppose some of them uh, were deployed over time. Um, so do you have any sense of uh, because there are like dozens of security testing tools for for EVM for the EVM uh, that came out in the in the last years. Do you have any sense that the security improved? Due to the emergence of so many tools, or did it did it have no impact? Uh, to be fair, I don't have numbers to kind of confirm this, but my kind of general understanding is that it d did improve, in fact. And as far as far as I'm from, I'm a little bit kind of departed from the Ethereum world. I'm not following that in that it that closely for the past couple of years. But as far as I understand, uh, for now, many typical contracts have already been designed, tested, and audited. And if I want to deploy my own token, for example, uh, it is uh, completely insane to develop from scratch. I take an open Zeppelin uh, template, I adapt it a little bit, and I deploy it. So because of this reuse of code, at least the security must have risen. And uh, as far as I can tell, again, I'm not following this closely, there had been much work in the solidity itself and the language features. And there are like, as, as you may have noticed, there are like these 2020 updates in the thesis because the paper which the chapter is based on was originally written in 2017. Lots of things have changed. And uh, a co-author of mine who continues following, following up and continues working in the space uh, helped me bring brought me up to speed. So um, many of the things have changed in the language design and some compiler warnings and some things that Solidity won't let you do. So I think the security overall did improve. Whether it is sufficient or not, it's kind of an open question. Um, I'm just trying to remember like in 2016, 17, there were like big hacks coming up every few months. We've had the parity hack two times and the DAO hack and whatnot. But for the past, I don't know, couple of years, were there such such large hacks when tens or hundreds of millions of dollars were stolen or frozen? I'm not sure. Nothing that immediately comes to mind. So I think it's getting better. OK, thanks. I have a question. Um... Uh, it's to do with the wallet section. I forget what chapter that is. Um, it's to do with privacy and wallets. I remember reading that one of the privacy criteria was that you had to be able to connect to the peer-to-peer -peer network and not a central, central entity. And I, I was a bit confused by that because um, like if I want to get privacy today on Ethereum, I really want network privacy that would, you know, prevent the first chapter from beating me, I would connect the Infura via Tor and semi transaction that way. Because then I'm part of the mixing set of all the Infura transactions. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. I mean, why was connecting to the peer-to-peer -peer network a very strong criteria for privacy? Yeah, that, I agree that there's a trade-off here. And this was uh, kind of, this research was done before this, um, Kind of in four became a thing or like to be honest we were focused there mostly on the cryptocurrency use case and the like payments use case and the idea was that connecting through a central server would let this central server associate my transactions with my ip address or my device id or whatnot so of course from the point of view of the external observer you kind of merge into the Infura anonymity set, which I think is quite large. But on the other hand, Infura itself knows your IP unless you connect through VPN or, or something, something, which in mobile wallets may be tricky. So um, I think I maybe, um, I think there might be even a section or a paragraph about this trade-off. So on the one hand, you have the anonymity set of all the users of a particular wallet. Uh, you kind of give up, give up your privacy to the wallet provider, but you are more private from the outside perspective. But on the other hand, you are, kind of, if you connect peer-to-peer -peer network, 
then no one can associate your activity with your IP address, but then you can be clustered based on your entry set. So there is a trade-off here. I agree. I agree with that. Okay. Uh, one one other question I have. This is like a footnote. Um, you basically say strictly spe strictly speaking, Samurai did not pass our initial test to connect to a remote node via RTC and not the peer-to-peer -peer node and required further control over it. But my understanding, I mean, I've never used Samurai, but my understanding is that a remote node is just my node. Like I could run Bitcoin Core and then I just connect to my own remote node. So maybe Samurai doesn't have the functionality to deal with the peer-to-peer -peer network so it relies on a Bitcoin Core node external. I just wanted to get uh, your thoughts on that because it was a footnote here. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, so basically, if you, um, yeah, let me put it this way. So if you want to use, at least my thinking goes like this, if you want to use a mobile wallet, that probably means that you want to uh, kind of get all the features you need only out of your mobile device. You want to be able to send and receive transactions as privately as possible and so on. Uh, from from my point of view, it's a little bit kind of um, misleading in a sense to expect a user using a mobile wallet to also have a full node running somewhere and connect from the mobile wallet to, to, to the full node. Like mobile wallets are usually thought of as a way to make your experience simpler with just your device that you use every day, like every every minute. But instead, if we assume that there is a full node running somewhere, just kind of the mobile wallet is in addition to this burden of running the full node. And, okay. um, yeah. Sounds like a usability issue than a privacy issue. It just sounds like they just want to connect to a full node, and that's like for advanced users. Yeah, but I, I, yeah, what I want to say is that uh, kind of a logical step, which is somewhat kind of implied, maybe I should uh, state it more explicitly, is that if we expect users to set, set up their own full nodes using a mobile wallet, most likely many of them will not do that. Instead, they will connect to some third party node, which as it turns out, they will have to fully trust and uh, like use RPC access of or something like that. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know how Samurai works. You do say here they need some control over the node. So I guess they, they might not be safe to use a remote node because then they would have all the keys. I just wanted to bring that up because I was just surprised by it because Electrum seems to pass the test. I mean, when I say pass the test, it still fails. But um, I got the impression that the, the best out of all of them, the Samurai is designed for privacy. So it'd be just cool to clarify that in, in the write up. Um, um, I have one other point that was to do with the Cedars. Um, I mean, I remember a couple of years ago, I, I remember trying to work out that you could have like, if you had a botnet of three, a 300K botnet, you could basically take over the Bitcoin network and exhaust all the connections. And then when I was reading your thesis, just made me think, uh, like what you write here is, I connected the DNS seeds, they give me the peers, I disconnect from the seeds, and then I go and connect to other peers. And I'd actually be interested to know how many open connections these DNS seeds actually make available. You know, could I just exhaust the DNS seeds and then stop people connecting to the peer-to-peer -peer network? Uh, I mean, I exhaust the, the you know the DNS seeds and the backup IP addresses, and I'd just be interested if they actually can be exhausted or if they accept all of the number of connections. That seems like an easy way to stop people getting on the Bitcoin network. Um, I thought I'd mention that to you. I mean, you could give comments if you want, but it's just what I thought of when I was reading it. I mean, the, no one's ever looked at the DNS seeds in a rigorous manner, and I feel like it's a weak point in the system. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting idea. Uh, we didn't ex uh, explore this possible attack vector, but um, I agree with the kind of with the idea that this initial bootstrapping phase and trying to understand who do I connect to is a weak point, possibly characteristic for all peer to peer networks because. If there is no center to ask who who should I connect to, I should somehow figure out it myself. And this is the weak point that can be attacked. By, but uh, yeah, as far as I know, it was pretty robust in practice. But I, I mean, they're all it's it's basically good. running the same script. I said uh, there's like one script that they all run. It's very lightweight. So um, I suspect you could exhaust all those connections and then you just block everyone's entry to the network, or you force them all onto a. I mean, I guess it's hard to become a DNS seed, but if you did become a DNS seed, then you could. Uh, Force everyone onto your your DNS seed. And I mean, that, that, that's basically all the comments I had for the most part. Uh, 
other questions from the committee? Yeah, maybe I have a follow-up question on um, smart check. Um, you, so the thesis does not really describe in detail uh, uh, what the static analysis does, but uh, um, as far as I can understand, it essentially performs uh, um, a, a set of synthetic checks in order to um, uh, discover certain types of vulnerabilities. And uh, you have an experimental evaluation where uh, um, smart check is uh, compared with uh, other tools like, uh, let's say, old days tools like Oyenta, but also more recent ones like Securify. And I noticed that on the programs that have been considered, smart check systematically has uh, uh, more true positives and less false negatives, despite the analysis uh, looking uh, relatively simple. So I, I was wondering uh, whether you can comment on that, why this is the case. Mm. It's a little bit hard to comment without um, looking at the source code of the contracts themselves. The um, possible explanation may be in that different tools may have different definitions of vulnerabilities and different subsets of vulnerabilities. So it may be the case that um, some of the things that we consider were kind of easier to detect or easier to detect with our method. Um, so basically, the kind of the evaluation on the selected contracts is not kind of meant as mm, as a kind of final word, and not not meant to say that smart check is better on on every use case. Uh, just to showcase what it does find on real world contracts, because on the big subset of contracts, we are not able to actually tell what is true finding or not. But on the uh, on the selected contracts, we were able to just look at them manually and determine what actually did happen there. And uh, yeah, so I think a bit more of a kind of proof of concept evaluation or um, yeah, not, not the definitive you are, answer. I see, and the fact that you are finding more true positive, is it due to the fact that you're checking more properties or is it due to the fact that somehow your queries are more precise? I was a bit uh, surprised in a sense that uh, there is uh, some, uh, so for instance, in Securify, there is uh, some semantic argument uh, while uh, smart check seems to be more syntactic. And um, so it's a bit uh, perhaps surprising to see uh, more precision um, in a syntactic static analyzer versus one that has uh, some uh, semantic ingredient. This may be this may be explained by the specifics of the specific contracts that we uh, that we analyzed. Maybe also the let me just look it up. It's on page uh, one hundred nineteen. Sorry to hijack the, the the discussion with the question on the team. Yeah. But since someone yeah. asked it before, then I thought I can as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one uh, one one point also may be that the Securify, for example, was limited in the version that we used. So probably they, I mean, in the full version that they have internally, they have more sophisticated checks and maybe they could have performed better, but by the, like, just based on the, on, on the availability of the tool to us, uh, as we use the free version, this was artificially kind of limited. That may be one explanation, at least what we can tell about Securify. Okay. Thanks. More questions? Good. So if there are not more questions from the committee, there's still the possibility for the audience 
to ask questions if there should be. I see that no one has questions from the audience. So I okay. I guess it will, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so if there are no questions from the audience, if there are no questions from the community anymore, then I think that we are done. Um, yeah, Sergey, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for answering all uh, the questions. Um, thank you. I close your defense now and we will proceed to the next step, which will be no longer public, but done only by the committee members. And um, well, you will be phoned later when we uh, announce the result. But now Ida will probably uh, yes. close the public part yes. and then we will start yes. with the I will, I will lock the event and then uh, just to ask Sergey, um, just to tell Sergey that I will, I will contact you via email in order to tell you when the event will be unlocked again. And then you can connect again using the same link. Okay. Okay, so I'll just okay. uh, follow my email now. Yep, I will. Uh, I will contact you via email once the deliberation has been uh, done. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, and for the for the audience, uh, if you want to try to reconnect in, I would say uh, it depends from. I don't know. I would say forty five minutes. Uh, Folker, what do you think about that? Well, we try to get it done in 45 minutes, I guess. <laughs> or maybe it's already it. evening here in Europe, so <laughs> they, I don't they, want to work until they, midnight. They can try to connect. If it's not open again, they will wait and then try to reconnect using the same link uh, again. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention for our questions. I'm disconnecting now, right? Yes, please.